the seventh console generation brought us some of the best handhelds ever conceived. Those being the Nintendo DS and PlayStation Portable. No, not the Gizmondo, Pandu, GP2X, and the other systems. Those don't count. Both the DS and PlayStation Portable had their upsides and downsides. The PlayStation Portable was generally more powerful, while the DS's unique design led to similarly unique games. And game-wise, both of them had simply incredible games. There are so many amazing games, in fact, that I will list off quite a few of my personal favorites now. On the DS, we have the entire Mario series, the Zelda games, Pokemon, Rune Factory, Phoenix Wright, Okami Den, Metroid Prime Hunters, Infinite Space, I could go on. On the PSP, we also have a load of great games. Ridge Racer, Afterburner, Gran Turismo, The God of War games, The GTA games, Metal Gear, SMT, Wipeout, I could also go on. Both of these consoles had quite a few fully 3D games on them, but also a lot of RPGs and some more casual games. Why is that? Well, the answer is of course the controls. The DS has a D-pad, four face buttons, two shoulder buttons, and a touchscreen. The PSP has the same set of controls, but with one joystick instead of a touchscreen. Do you see the problem? No? Well, how about this? Fully 3D games need dual analog. In something like a third-person game, let it be Mario or Metal Gear, one joystick controls the movement, while the other joystick controls the camera. In something like an FPS game, one stick controls the movement, and the other stick controls the camera. Again. The issue here is that we don't really have that. The DS was actually kind of better off in some games, like for instance Metroid Prime Hunters, where you can use the touchpad to aim. It's a bit jank, but it works relatively okay. Better than using your buttons, at least. So, at the end of the day, the solution is actually really simple, and uh, I will now present to you my Photoshop bot job. So, if the PSP had dual analog sticks, along with the DS, what would it change? Oh, and uh, before you say, uh, the DS couldn't have had thumbsticks because they'd be too tall. Uh, the DS had speakers on the lower end of the front top plate, and uh, you could have left indents for the joysticks up there, and there would be nothing bad, and it would have just worked. You see, basically any 3D game you see on home systems at the time, well, it could have been way more easily ported. A lot of FPS games were actually utterly ass on the DS and PSP, and this would have completely fixed them. A lot of third-person games on the PSP and DS also had pretty shitty camera controls due to a lack of a right analog stick, or an analog stick altogether, in the case of the DS. The result of adding the sticks would have done a lot more than just improve the gaming experience for anyone playing a 3D game on these platforms. It would have made a large amount of developers want to make good, high-quality 3D games on the platform too, as now they have proper control schemes they would have needed to manage home console-level gameplay along with quite decent graphics. But clearly, they didn't bother implementing these kinds of controls in either system. And the reason why might seem unclear at first. I mean, Sony already had an analog stick, so why not slap on a second one? The DS was already more powerful than the Nintendo 64. This can be seen with Mario 64 DS, a launch shuttle for the system. So, why didn't either of these companies bother? The reason why dual analog was never a thing in these systems is that mobile gaming was seen kind of as a side gig to these companies, with simpler, less powerful hardware for simpler, less demanding games. But the sheer raw power of the new hardware just demanded better controls, which while in hindsight we know now would have been great, was something that neither Sony nor Nintendo knew would have been important at the time. To be fair, both Sony and Nintendo, after a while, did iterate with their next consoles, both having analog sticks, with the Vita having two of them and the 3DS needing a Circle Pad Pro mod or the new model in order to have them. Too bad the Vita died of no gameitis. The no gameitis the Vita died of is actually a bit of a symptom of the power of the Vita's unique hardware. It sort of happened to the 3DS as well, 
But I'd argue the shittiness and slowness of the 3DS's hardware made it relatively immune to that for most of its life. You see, instead of making unique games for the PlayStation Vita, a lot of companies saw it as a mobile, less powerful PlayStation 3, and uh, because of that, just ported their games to the console instead of making unique ones. This also happened on the Nintendo 3DS with games like Donkey Kong Returns, Xenoblade Chronicles 3D, which I still have no idea how they pulled that off, Kirby's Extra Epic Yarn, Rayman Origins, and so on. Yeah, a lot of pretty decent exclusives came to the Vita, but also a lot of Vita games were just ports of games on the PS3 or PS4. And because of that, why would you want to play a worse version of a PS4 game on your Vita when your PS4 is perfectly capable of playing it? Exactly, most people wouldn't, which is why the Vita didn't sell that well. Most Vita games were beloved, yet the console only sold around 15 million units, which is more than the Wii U, mind you, but still a far cry from those 80 million units Sony was expecting. Now yes, this drop was partially due to the shitty proprietary Vita memory cards, and partially due to mobile gaming taking off, however, the 3DS still sold like crazy, and lots of people, even today, would like to own something like a Vita. A relatively small console, the Vita screen was around 5 inches in size, that could run some pretty good games on it, portably. It's why the Switch sold well, and why the 3DS sold well, even though they're horribly underpowered. The truth really is that people want unique, fun experiences on mobile platforms, and the Vita had so many ports you could just run on other, better platforms that there was no real point in getting one. Mobile gaming, however, while extremely popular, hasn't replaced console or PC experiences for a simple reason. The controls. Most mobile games are interacted with by simply tapping on the screen or are relatively slow like Minecraft because glass is horribly unresponsive when used as a button, so you don't have the tactile feeling that you'd get on a console or on a keyboard. This is why console games on mobile often suck in the control department. If you've ever tried to emulate something like a Game Boy Advance game on your phone, you'd know how uncomfortable it is to play. This is why portable gaming consoles will never die. In the last few years, we've even had portable PCs like the Steam Deck, ROG Ally, InWin, and many others. They're basically just portable gaming systems, but they're of course pretty niche, as they lack any unique games and instead offer you to play your PC games on the go. So, if you don't care about playing your already existing PC games on the go in worse quality, you don't need one. Which is exactly why the DS and PSP were so popular. They had great and unique games you could play on the go, as they were made for it, not ported to it. And since the 3DS and Vita were more powerful, more and more companies decided to port their games onto them, which ended up making the games and consoles sell worse as the games were no longer unique. Dual Analog would have made the DS and PSP be able to control better, however the console's limited hardware wouldn't have allowed the types of ports we've seen in the 8th console generation, making it so a large amount of games would have still been completely unique. None of this, however, stops the DS, 3DS, PSP or Vita from being amazing little consoles all of which had great games.